From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Here's a woman who decided she didn't want to come forward. She was very explicit about that. And that promise was kept. And somehow, because reporters and the world hounded her, she had all of the negatives of coming forward and none of the positives. She had no good choices. And now she's been forced to be a spectacle. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford has come forward on the record with allegations that Brett Kavanaugh sexually assaulted her when they were both in high school. She says she will testify about the attempted rape. She expected her story to be kept confidential, but changed her mind after it leaked. We'll speak with Slate's Dahlia Lithwick, who argues our system is too broken to assess the sexual assault claim against Kavanaugh. We'll also speak with Think Progress reporter Ian Milheiser, who tweeted, So to summarize, a confessed serial sexual predator nominated a man who's credibly accused of attempted rape to be key vote to strip women of reproductive freedom. Last week, Milheiser's piece, headlined, Brett Kavanaugh has a mysterious Me Too problem, was declared fake news by a Facebook fact-checker with the conservative outlet The Weekly Standard. Then to Dallas, where protests continue in the wake of the shooting and killing of a 26-year-old black man in his own apartment by a white Dallas police officer who mistakenly thought his apartment was hers. What's his name? Welcome John! 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 What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Justice! Police officer Amber Geiger has been charged with manslaughter after she entered Botham Shem John's apartment less than two weeks ago and opened fire, killing him. Police claim she believed it to be her apartment. We'll go to Dallas to speak with his family's lawyer, Lee Merritt. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. In an explosive interview with The Washington Post, California professor Dr. Christine Blasey Ford has accused Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of attempted rape while the two were in high school. She told The Post Kavanaugh and his friend pushed her into a bedroom during a party, and that Brett Kavanaugh then forcibly pinned her down on a bed and tried to pull off her clothes. She says she tried to scream, but that Kavanaugh put his hand over her mouth to silence her. She told The Washington Post, I thought he might inadvertently kill me. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is a professor at Palo Alto University in California. She teaches at Stanford University. She began speaking anonymously about the alleged assault in July after Kavanaugh was shortlisted to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. She contacted her Congress member and the Washington Post through a tip line. She took and passed a polygraph. After her story began to leak, she changed her mind and decided to go public. Her lawyer says Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is willing to publicly testify before Congress. The attempted rape accusation comes only days before the Senate Judiciary Committee was slated to vote on Kavanaugh's confirmation to the Supreme Court on Thursday. In the wake of the explosive accusation, three Senate Republicans, Senators Jeff Flake, Bob Corker and Lisa Murkowski and a slew of Democrats have said the Senate Judiciary Committee should delay the vote. It was Senator Dianne Feinstein of California who had the letter that Dr. Blasey wrote, but asked her to keep confidential. At least 17 people in North and South Carolina have been reported killed by Tropical Depression Florence, which has broken all of North Carolina's rainfall records. Officials are warning the worst of the storm may still be yet to come, as catastrophic flooding inundates the Carolina's coast. Up to 20,000 people are in emergency shelters in North Carolina alone. This is North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper. Flood waters are still raging across parts of our state, and the risk to life is rising with the angry waters. As this storm continues to churn through North Carolina, it has dumped nearly two feet or more of rain in many places. The strongest storm bands are dumping two to three inches of rain per hour. That's enough to cause flooding 
in areas that have never flooded before until now. Experts have warned Florence could also cause widespread environmental damage and toxic spills from coal ash dumps, hog manure lagoons, chicken farms and nuclear facilities in North and South Carolina. Torrential rains have already caused a collapse at a coal ash landfill at an inactive Duke Energy power plant. Duke Energy says 20,000 cubic tons of ash were released and could run off into the nearby Cape Fear River. In Asia, Typhoon Mankut continued to wreak destruction in its path, reaching mainland China after ripping through the Philippines and Hong Kong. Authorities say the storm has killed at least 69 people so far, with the death toll expected to rise. Over the weekend, authorities found 43 bodies buried in a landslide near a gold mine in the Philippines. Officials say as many as 100 people may have died in this landslide alone. Meanwhile, in China, more than 3 million people have been evacuated from the path of the storm. So far, at least four people have reportedly died in China from the storm, which has now been downgraded to a tropical depression. The head of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, is trying to defend President Trump, who sparked outreach la outrage last week by falsely claiming that thousands of people did not die in Puerto Rico last year in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. This is FEMA Administrator Brock Long speaking on CBS's Face the Nation. These are all over the place. The Harvard study was done differently, studies a different period of time versus the George Washington study. Uh, there's a big discrepancy, whether it's direct deaths or indirect deaths. FEMA Administrator Brock Long also spoke on NBC's Meet the Press, in which he claimed that some of the post-Maria deaths may be attributed to spousal abuse, saying you can't blame spousal abuse after a disaster on anybody. You know, the other thing that goes on, there's all kinds of studies on this that we take a look at. Spousal abuse goes through the roof. You can't blame spousal abuse, you know, after a disaster on anybody. The official death toll from Hurricane Maria stands at 2,975. One Harvard study has estimated the death toll might be as high as 4,645 people. In Gaza, hundreds of people gathered for the funeral of 12-year-old Shadi Abdel Al, a Palestinian boy who died during Friday's weekly nonviolent protests at the separation fence between Gaza and Israel. Gaza's health ministry says the boy was killed by a blunt object that cracked open his skull, though it's unclear whether he was killed by Israeli soldiers firing live ammunition, grenades or another object. Israeli soldiers shot and killed two other Palestinians during Friday's protest. Palestinian Palestinian health officials say Israeli soldiers have killed at least 186 Palestinians and wounded tens of thousands more since the Palestinians' nonviolent Great March of Return began on March 30th. Meanwhile, in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, authorities say a Palestinian teenager fatally stabbed an Israeli at a shopping mall on Sunday. The victim, 40-year-old Ari Fuld, was a father of four and lived in the Israeli-only West Bank settlement of Efrat. The alleged attacker was shot after the stabbing and is currently hospitalized. Pope Francis has expelled a Chilean priest over allegations of child sexual abuse. Reverend Christian Precht had previously been under investigation and was suspended for five years in 2012. The announcement of Precht's expulsion comes as the Chilean church has been rocked by allegations of widespread sexual abuse and cover-up. In May, every bishop in Chile offered their resignation in response to the growing scandal. In Washington, D.C., a Blackwater contractor will stand trial for first-degree murder for the third time over his role in the 2007 Nisar Square massacre in central Baghdad, where Blackwater contractors killed 17 civilians after opening fire with machine guns and grenades on a crowded public space. The attack has been called the Milai Massacre of Iraq. In 2014, Nick Slatton was convicted on murder charges over the massacre and sentenced to life in prison, but an appeals court later voided that conviction. In addition to throwing out Slatton's murder conviction, the panel also overturned the 30-year terms given to the other defendants, saying the sentences violated the Constitution's prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Slatton's second trial ended in a hung jury two weeks ago. 
President Trump has threatened to impose a new round of tariffs on $200 billion on Chinese products, ranging from refrigerators to Apple watches. The threat of the 10 percent tariffs have alarmed Wall Street executives, including the heads of Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, the Blackstone Group and others, who flew to Beijing for hastily arranged meetings, including one with China's vice president today, to discuss strengthening business ties between the U.S. and China. Trump's latest tariff threat may also jeopardize the planned trade talks between Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin and top Chinese officials later this month. In Texas, a supervisory Border Patrol agent has been arrested for murder after authorities say he confessed to killing four women. Agent Juan David Ortiz was arrested after a fifth woman narrowly escaped murder and alerted authorities. Officials say Agent Ortiz was targeting women sex workers. He's worked as a Border Control agent for 10 years and is a U.S. Navy veteran. This is Webb County District Attorney Isidro Alanis. The law enforcement uh, investigators uh, indicates that uh, there's probable cause to believe that this individual is responsible for uh, this series of, of murders, which I would qualify as a serial murder uh, that, we, that we have. So we will be looking at what charges to put on him, uh, potentially uh, four charges of uh, murder and uh, aggravated kidnapping. Guatemala's highest court has ordered President Jimmy Morales to allow the United Nations-backed Anti-Corruption Commission to return to Guatemala and carry out its investigation into graft and illegal campaign financing. This is the second time in two years that Guatemala's constitutional court has ruled in favor of the commission over the president. Mass protests erupted after President Morales tried to shut down the investigation, which is investigating the president for over $1 million in illicit campaign financing. Similar investigations by the commission have brought down other high-ranking Guatemalan leaders, including the the previous president, Otto Pérez Molina. In Germany, thousands protested Sunday against the planned expansion of a coal mine in Hambach Forest by German company RWE. The expansion would require clearing the forest, which has been occupied by environmental activists since 2012, in an effort to prevent the project from moving forward. Forced evictions of activist tree houses started last week after German authorities ordered the immediate clearing of the area. The mine is the largest open pit coal mine in Europe, producing a highly polluting fossil fuel called lignite. For more on the resistance in Hambach Forest, you can go to our website at democracynow.org. We visited Hambach Forest last year and went into the trees where the tree sitters continued to have uh, their tree houses. And over the weekend, activists in Europe protested outside banks in France and Germany to mark the 10-year anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, whose bankruptcy on September 15, 2008, is seen as the start of the global financial crisis. Millions of people in the United States and around the world lost their jobs, homes and life savings, even as the U.S. government bailed out some of Wall Street's biggest failing banks. The financial crisis also sparked massive global anti capitalist movements, including the Occupy movement and the M15 movement in Spain and the massive anti-austerity movements in Greece. This is activist Aurélie Trouvet speaking at the protest in France this weekend. Eh bien, faire en sorte que cet argent qu'on aille le chercher. The government should make it so that we can take the money from the wealthiest from financial institutions for this ecological and social transition. Today, they make us believe that the money isn't there, but I assure you that with an efficient tax on financial transactions, with a real fight against fiscal evasion, we will have the means and the needed money for this ecological and social transition. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin to do today's show with explosive allegations against President Trump's Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, that stem from an interview published Sunday by The Washington Post with a woman who's come forward to accuse Kavanaugh of attempting to rape her in high school. She now says she's willing to testify about her experience. Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is a professor at Palo Alto University in California, and she also teaches at Stanford. She said she first expected her story to be kept confidential, but changed her mind after it leaked. 
The Washington Post reports now Ford has decided that if her story is going to be told, she wants to be the one to tell it. Speaking on the record to a reporter for the first time, Dr. Blasey Ford said in the early 1980s, Kavanaugh and a friend were, quote, stumbling drunk when they pushed her into a bedroom at a party. The Post reports, while his friend watched, she said Kavanaugh pinned her to a bed on her back and groped her over her clothes, grinding his body against hers and clumsily attempting to pull off her one-piece bathing suit and the clothing she wore over it. When she tried to scream, she said, he put his hand over her mouth. I thought he might inadvertently kill me, said Ford. He was trying to attack me and remove my clothing, the Washington Post reported. Blasey Ford said. Dr. Blasey Ford said she was able to escape when Kavanaugh's friend jumped on top of them. They all went tumbling to the ground. She said she never spoke about the attack until 2012 during couples therapy with her husband, who said his wife used Kavanaugh's last name. Then, in early July, after Kavanaugh was shortlisted to replace retiring Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, Dr. Blasey Ford contacted her Congress member, California Democrat Anna Eschew, and then sent a letter via Eschew's office to California Senator Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Later in July, she contacted The Washington Post through a tip line. She also took a polygraph test regarding the incident, which the paper reviewed, and she passed. But for weeks, she declined to go public, citing concerns about her and her family and privacy, even as Judge Kavanaugh could still be confirmed. Blasey Ford told The Post, quote, why suffer through the annihilation if it's not going to matter? But last Wednesday, The Intercept broke the news that Senator Feinstein had a letter describing an incident involving Kavanaugh and a woman in high school, and that Feinstein was refusing to share it with her Democratic colleagues. Feinstein then issued a statement that the author had, quote, strongly requested confidentiality, declined to come forward or press the matter further, and I have honored that decision. I have, however, referred the matter to federal investigative authorities, Feinstein said. The FBI reportedly sent the letter to the White House to be included in Kavanaugh's background file after redacting Blasey Ford's name, which then sent it to all of the senators on the Senate Judiciary Committee. On Friday, The New Yorker magazine reported the letter's contents but did not reveal Blasey Ford's identity. As reporters began to visit Blasey's home to ask for comment, she ultimately decided to speak to The Washington Post and identify herself for the story that it published on Sunday. Judge Kavanaugh has since repeated his previous denial that such an incident ever took place. All 11 Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee are men. Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Republican Charles Grassley responded by uh, releasing a letter from 65 women who say they knew Kavanaugh in high school and that, quote, he has behaved honorably and treated women with respect and has stood out for his friendship, character, integrity. Meanwhile, three Senate Republicans, Senators Jeff Flake, Bob Corker and Lisa Murkowski, and a slew of Democrats have said the Senate Judiciary Committee should delay the vote. This is Murkowski speaking to CNN Sunday about the new allegations. I'm going to be talking with my colleagues, but I really don't have anything to add at this at this point. As I said, I did ask, I did read the letter last week and asked the judge in a telephone conversation on Friday about it, and he was very emphatic and. Den his denial. Do you believe the accuser? I don't know enough to, to make a judgment at this point. That was Maine Senator Republican Susan Collins. This morning, shortly before we went to broadcast, Dr. Blasey Ford's attorney, Deborah Katz, told CNN her client is willing to testify before Congress. Will your client, Christine Ford, be willing to testify in public to the Judiciary Committee? The answer is yes. 
she is willing to do it. Has she been asked by any of the lawmakers to do that? That's interesting. The answer is no. She's not been asked, but she is now willing to do so. Is she in conversations with people? Have people, have the lawmakers reached out and tried to talk to her via phone? We've heard from no one. We've seen various statements made on television, but uh, in statements uh, that are being bandied about for political reason. But no one's asked her. No. That was CNN's uh, host, Alison Camerata, uh, speaking to Dr. Blasey Ford's attorney. Well, for more, we're joined in our New York studio by Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor at Slate.com. She's their senior legal correspondent and Supreme Court reporter, hosts the podcast Amicus. Her latest story is headlined, Our System is Too Broken to Assess the Sexual Assault Claim Against Kavanaugh. Do you still feel that way? As Dr. Blasey has come forward— She's been very clear in this letter, though this letter was not made clear to Democrats or Republicans on the committee until it was leaked uh, by The Intercept and then a series of developments unfolded. I think I still feel that way. I feel pretty strongly that neither journalism nor high, high, high intensity Senate confirmation hearings are the appropriate fact-finding, reason-based enterprises to come to the bottom of this. And I think I probably still feel, as I felt when I wrote the piece, that the cost of forcing somebody into this system to have this conversation under the Klieg lights of a Senate hearing where nobody is willing to be persuaded because the battle lines have been drawn is the very, very worst way if what you really want to do is have a truth-seeking enterprise. Uh, this is not the way to do so it. So the question is, though, <clears throat> should Judge Kavanaugh be confirmed as Supreme Court justice? The the um, day that's set for the Senate Judiciary Committee vote is Thursday. Uh, Dr. Blasey has said she will testify about what happened, and Judge Kavanaugh has denied that it happened. But clearly, um, more can be found out. This is just happening right now at the last minute. And what, Wednesday is Yom Kippur, so that'll be a day off. So they only have two days. And interestingly, um, uh, Dr. Blasey Ford's lawyer said— they have not talked to it. No senator has contacted them since yesterday, since her name came forward. Grassley has not. It, it seems to me this is materially changes the game. It is what you'll hear from the Republican senators in terms of pushback isn't I don't believe her. It isn't uh, that uh, she doesn't have a name and a face because now she does have a name and a face. So all we're hearing is it's too late. It's too late. These hearings that we rushed along, we refused to disclose, you know, tens and thousands of pages of documents. Now, explain that a little further for people who haven't been following this. Well, I think this entire thing was entirely corroded by the fact that, for the first time in history, 90 percent of Kavanaugh's documents were withheld uh, from the public, from the Judiciary Committee. They were being vetted, not by the National Archives, as documents have traditionally been vetted. They were being vetted by a Republican lawyer who had worked with uh, Judge Kavanaugh in an earlier life. The whole system was designed to sort of rocket this thing through with minimal scrutiny. And that's almost every time that Kavanaugh was tripped up last week in the hearings. It was because something came out that should have been disclosed earlier. And so this is another matter where you can certainly say, oh, it's too late, it's too late. But this time clock was created by the same Senate Judiciary Committee Republicans who held a seat vacant for over a year when it was Merrick Garland, Garland's turn to be vetted. <clears throat> I wanted to bring Ian Milheiser into this discussion, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress Action Fund and the editor of Think Progress Justice. Before we get into your piece, Ian, just this latest news and your response. Yeah, well, let me say the most important thing I'll probably say, which is that I believe Christine Blasey Ford. This is a very credible accusation. You know, in journalism, one thing that we look at when a person who is in the news is accused of something is whether the accuser made the accusation before um, the person was in the news. And in this case, she told her therapist about this in 2012. The Washington Post obtained the therapist's notes, which is a truly extraordinary thing for a newspaper to obtain. 
Um, so this is an extraordinarily credible allegation. And I think in any sensible world, the Senate would hit pause on this confirmation process. They would dig in deep to, into this allegation. And they would not vote to confirm this man unless they were absolutely sure that this allegation was false. And what do you think should happen at this point, Ian? Well, I mean, like I said, I think they should hit pause on the nomination. Um, you know, the Professor Ford has said that she is willing to testify, so they can reopen the hearings, they can bring her in to testify. And the standard here, I mean, at, at this stage, when you have this credible an allegation, the burden of proof should be on the people who want Kavanaugh to be confirmed. This is not a criminal trial where you have a beyond a reasonable doubt standard. This is a case where Brett Kavanaugh, who was nominated to be the fifth vote to kill Roe v. Wade, um, is going to be given immense power over tens of millions of people, and specifically tens of millions of women. And you don't give someone that kind of power if you are unsure as to whether or not they committed attempted rape. We're going to break and then come back to this discussion. Our guests are Ian Milheiser, um, uh, editor of Think Progress Justice, senior fellow at Center for American Progress Action Fund. And we're joined by Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor at Slate.com, their senior legal correspondent and Supreme Court reporter. This is Democracy Now! Back in a minute. <laughs> Sometimes they don't tell the truth. Smiling faces, smiling faces tell lies, and I got proof. Oh, Lord, yeah. Faces sometimes the undisputed truth. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Last week, Think Progress published a report by senior fellow Ian Milheiser that was headlined, Brett Kavanaugh said he would kill Roe v. Wade last week and almost no one noticed. The story was declared fake news by a Facebook fact checker with the conservative outlet The Weekly Standard which attacked Ian Milheiser in an editorial headline, Kavanaugh Needs No Defense. Milheiser wrote that Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh may have committed a very serious crime, possibly even a sex crime, or maybe he didn't. That's what we just learned from an extraordinarily vague press statement by Senator Dianne Feinstein, unquote. The editors at the Weekly Standard responded, quote, nope, that's not what we learned from Feinstein's statement, because you can't learn that maybe a thing happened and maybe it didn't. All we'll learn about the mendacious commentary on it from hitmen like Milheiser is that Senate Democrats are willing to disgrace themselves and defame a good man in order to propitiate their most vicious supporters, the Weekly Standard wrote. For more, we continue our conversation with Ian Milheiser, the senior fellow at the Center for American Progress Action Fund and the editor of Think Progress Justice, as well as Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor at Slate.com. This is complicated, Ian. Can you right. please explain what happened? Yeah, sure. I mean, suffice it to say, the folks at the Weekly Standard don't like me very much. Um, I think that their assertion that Brett Kavanaugh is such a good man is not um, wearing well this week. Um, but what happens? So there's two different pieces here, and I think the first piece is, is the more important one. So I wrote this piece, and it made a legal argument. It said that in Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation hearing, he said that he would apply something called the Glucksberg rule 
in determining whether or not a right is protected by the Constitution. And I took that statement, and then I laid it against another statement in he made in uh, 2017, where he said that Roe v. Wade is inconsistent with Glucksburg. So in his hearing, he said he would apply Glucksburg. In 2017, he said Roe v. Wade is inconsistent with Glucksburg. It's not that hard to figure out what he thinks about Roe v. Wade. And the Weekly Standard is one of five outlets, the only ideological outlet, there's no, there's no liberal outlet that has the power to do this, that Facebook has given the power to censor other content that is, public, that is shared on Facebook if that content is deemed to have a factual error. And so the Weekly Standard decided, and it's this really narrow semantic dispute. In my headline, I said, he said it and no one noticed. You know, does the word said mean that he has to say the exact words or not say the exact words? I have heard more opinions on that question this past two weeks than I ever thought possible. Um, but in any event, they use this power to censor pieces, to censor my piece, to label it fa fake news, to impose the exact same sanction on me and this piece that would be imposed upon a piece that claimed that the Pope endorsed Donald Trump or some other completely fabricated lie. And what our position has been throughout all of this is the weekly standard, our ideological enemy, so, you know, a, a, an outlet that personally attacked me in an editorial last week, should not have the power to censor my work or any other liberal outlet's work. It is a conflict of interest, and Facebook should strip them of that authority. Now, so let's talk about what happened next. Mm -hmm. um, the Intercept, which is the one that broke the story about the secret letter that, Di that Dianne right. Feinstein had, um, The Intercept republished your piece, right. saying the story was effectively nuked from Facebook, with other outlets threatened with traffic and monetary consequences if they shared it. This is extremely significant. Explain. This isn't just the right. Weekly Standard weighing in. Explain what happened with Facebook. Sure. So the way that Facebook works. So, I mean, if I can get a little bit into the business of journalism, I don't think it's a big secret that digital journalism is driven by clicks. You know, the, the more people who come and visit the site, the more ad revenue you get. And that means the more journalists you're able to employ. Um, Facebook has a system, and they send about 10 or 15 percent of Think Progress's total traffic to us. Facebook has a system where if one of these five ch fact checkers, and again, it's four nonpartisan outlets and the Weekly Standard that has this power, if they deem something to be fake news, then it loses 80 percent of the tr of the traffic it would have gotten from Facebook. That's the first thing that happens. The second thing is that a push notification is sent to everyone who shared it, informing them that it is, quote, false news. And then the third thing that it happens is everyone who shared it, even the people who shared it before the Weekly Standard weighed it, weighs in, gets punished. All of their content gets downgraded and is less likely to show up in people's news feeds from that, from that point forward. So the Weekly Standard has an extraordinary power, not just to censor, um, their rival outlets, but to effectively try to nuke the bottom line of um, outlets that they disagree with. And our position is, look, you, you know, if, if I were a, if I were a defense attorney and I walked into court and the prosecutor was sitting there wearing a black robe and wielding a gavel, I would say that's not appropriate because you're not allowed to be the judge of your own case. When you are um, one of the adversaries in a debate, you shouldn't also get to judge who is telling the truth. Hmm. Dahlia, you want to lay in, weigh in here? No, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Ian. For one thing, Mark Stern and I had written a very similar piece about Glucksburg and whole women's health a few days, uh, you know, at around the same time that Ian wrote his. Ours didn't get tagged. Uh, his got tagged entirely for a <laughs> semantic internal fight about literally and, what and the said the significance means. of this, I mean, Facebook determines what so many people read. I mean, it's um, as if you're talking on the telephone. That's what it's basically become. And the phone company is beeping out words that it doesn't agree with. When Facebook has this kind of monopoly uh, on information, when they deem something is not true, and I want to take this a step further. Ian, if you can say who the fact checker was that deemed your piece fake news. Yes. Yeah, so the, the name of the fact checker, it's Holmes. I think his last name is pronounced Librand. 
And um, as he graduated from college in 2016, he doesn't have a law degree. Um, you know, I mean, based on when he graduated from college, he's probably 25 years old. And what Facebook has done here is they have given a single 25-year-old staffer at the Weekly Standard the power to decide which now, news gets read and which news does not get read. You know, I want to take this a step further, because we've been talking about this astounding um, report of um, Dr. Blasey Ford, mm -hmm. who says she is now willing to testify before the committee about what she alleges Brett Kavanaugh did to her in high school, the attempted rape. Right. Um, and she's made available um, <clears throat> all sorts of information in the Washington Post piece, uh, the notes of her therapist in 2012, when she was in couples therapy with her husband, describing what happened to her, and again in 2013, when she described his attempted rape. Um, the third man in the room, while she alleges Brett Kavanaugh held her down, groped her, tried to rip her clothes off and put his hand over her mouth, and she was terrified she could die— the third man in the room was Mark Judge, right. uh, Brett Kavanaugh's friend from the elite prep school. Mark Judge is a filmmaker um, who writes for, among other publications, the Weekly Standard. Yep. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's a lot of things about Mr. Judge that I think, uh, you know, are sketchy. Um, he apparently wrote a memoir. It's sort of thinly fictionalized. Instead of calling the school Georgetown um, Country Day, which is his actual name, he calls it Loyola Country Day. There's even a character in that book who's briefly mentioned named Bart O'Kavanaugh. And Bart O'Kavanaugh at one point gets drunk and pukes in a car. Um, but Mr. Judge's book is pretty tremendous. You know, he, he, he talks about um, a lot of drinking and mistreatment of women. Uh, his yearbook quote at Georgetown, a, 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 at the prep school that he and Kavanaugh went to, is some women need to be beaten like a gong or something to that or to that effect. Or I believe it's some, some women need to be beaten regularly like a gong. So this is the character witness that uh, Brett Kavanaugh is bringing in to say, yeah, I, I didn't do it. Um, you know, he, he saw it happen, and, and I wasn't there. And the, um, and the yeah. book Mark Judge uh, wrote is called Wasted Tales of a Gen X right. Drunk, which describes his blackout drinking and culture of partying at um, right. his elite high school. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's this extraordinary book that, like, if you were to write something to destroy your credibility and to destroy your credibility, particularly in this instance where the accusation is that you and a classmate got drunk and participated in the sexual abuse of a woman, this book would completely blow your credibility. Um, Dahlia Lithwick, um, go back to Anita Hill. Um, go back to the hearings. Of course, the echoes of this are so strong right now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such an amazing—the uh, arc of this is extraordinary, because if you remember, after Anita Hill testified in front of an all-male Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, Senate Democrats declined to bring forward witnesses who would have corroborated uh, her story on both sides. And it was, chief among those Democrats at the time— Was Joe Biden. Senator Joe Biden. And, and it was a disaster. It was a dumpster fire. But it led to what we now nostalgically think about as the year of the woman. And women like Dianne Feinstein, a lot of women in the Senate uh, uh, say that was the watershed. And women were furious at the treatment of Anita Hill and pushed women into the Senate in record numbers. Here we are at the other end of that arc. That was, was uh, you know, a long time ago, and yet it seems as though very little has changed. And if you look at, you map the, the points of that story onto what we're seeing now, here's a woman who comes forward reluctantly. She doesn't want to uh, be outed. She is outed. There's a, a This all happens after the hearing is formally over. I mean, at each turn, it looks exactly the same. Well, Anita Hill has issued a statement on the sexual allegations uh, against the sexual misconduct, attempted rape allegations against Brett Kavanaugh. Um, she said, given the seriousness of these allegations, the government needs to find a fair and neutral way for complaints to be investigated. I have seen firsthand what happens when such a process is weaponized, she said. So now I want to go back to a clip from the 1991 confirmation hearings for Supreme Court nominee at the time, 
Clarence Thomas when Anita Hill testified during the hearing alleging sexual harassment against Thomas. This is from Anita Hill's opening statement. After approximately three months of working there, he asked me to go out socially with him. What happened next and telling the world about it are the two most difficult things, experiences of my life. It is only after a great deal of agonizing consideration and sleepless number, great number of sleepless nights that I am able to talk of these unpleasant matters to anyone but my close friends. So, Dahlia Lithwick, talk about this, the enormous pressure that Anita Hill is under. And right now, I mean, I think something that goes clearly to the credibility of Dr. Christine Blasey is that she felt she needed to tell someone, but did not want to come forward, did not want this to be made public. But when reporters started crawling around her workplace and her home, um, uh, you know, were there and asking her to speak, she felt, if this story is going to be told, she wants it to be told by her. Now, this is going to be at great, great personal expense, she fears. Remember that hearing. Remember what happened to Anita Hill, that there were Republicans on that committee who coined the term a little bit nutty and a little bit slutty, right? She was derided for being promiscuous. She was derided for being a liar. They said, why didn't you come forth at the time? I mean, all the questions about her integ integrity, you know, what do you mean you didn't report? He was her boss and she didn't report? How is that possible? And at every turn, given the opportunity to actually listen to what she was saying or to malign her personally, the decision was made to malign her personally. And she has spent the rest of her life, you know, she had said after the hearing, I'm going to take a year and try to sort out this sexual harassment in the workplace thing. All these years later, she's still doing it. And so I think if you look at the ways in which—and she's amazing, by the way, I just want to say, like, having gone through the wood chipper, she is extraordinarily hopeful that the sort of arc of the of the moral universe is trending toward fairness, but the ways in which this maps so perfectly onto her experience. And immediately when Dr. Ford came forward, we started hearing, you know, murmurs about maybe she was drunk and why didn't she come forward? And, you know, they were just kids and who among us hasn't uh, assaulted a 15-year-old and, and drunkenly at a party? And so in a very profound way, what's depressing about this is how little has changed, even though so much should have changed right after her hearing. So, Ian Milheiser, what do you foresee for this week? Um, uh, there were discussions that maybe staffers would speak to both Brett Kavanaugh right. and Dr. Blasey. Um, but clearly, Dr. Blasey has set the stakes much higher now by saying she is willing to testify. Right. She didn't want to take this risk, but at this point, she feels it is her only choice. Yeah, I, th I think all lives are going to be in a handful of Republican senators. Certainly, Collins and Murkowski, who people have been looking at for a while as, like, the only realistic votes against Kavanaugh. Jeff Flake, who is a flake and, like, has a tendency to say big things and then not follow through on them. But maybe this time he will, and he will. Um, stop a positive vote from happening on Kavanaugh on the committee. Uh, maybe Bob Corker. There's a handful of Republicans. And, and what the thing to keep the thing to keep in mind is this: two Republican senators have the power to stop this. If two Republican senators come forward and say we will vote no on Brett Kavanaugh until we get to the bottom of this, that puts a stop to this. It stops the Thursday vote in the committee. It stops Mitch McConnell from ramming this vote through. All it takes is two Republican senators to come forward and say, we need to know what happened here before this person is giving a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court of the United States. So you already have a number of senators speaking. You have Corker, <laughs> you have Flake, and then there's Murkowski and Collins. There are already four Republicans who are wavering here. They're wavering. But what we need more is wavering. I mean, what we need is definitive statements. If Jeff Flake wants to stop this, if he wants to show integrity, and Jeff Flake is retiring, so he has nothing to lose, the magic words that Jeff Flake needs to use is, I will vote no on Brett Kavanaugh if the Thursday vote is not canceled. And until we hear those magic words from Jeff Flake, 
you know, he hasn't said very much. And, of course, Corker also is retiring. Right. Corker is also retiring. And, and you know, Susan Collins is the senator from a blue state. She's the senator from Maine. She can run, you know, but even before this happened, she could run for re-election in 2020 as the senator who saved Roe v. Wade or as the senator who killed Roe v. Wade. Now she, she can be the senator who puts someone who has a credible allegation of attempted rape on the Supreme Court, or she can be the person who said, stop. And, you know, if I were— um, we just lost uh, Ian on um, on this issue, but Dahlia, you're covering this very same beat about what Susan Collins can do. Two two important things that Ian just said that are really worth reiterating: these folks don't have to vote no on Kavanaugh. All they have to do is vote no on Kavanaugh until we find out what happened. That's an awfully low risk proposition, given, as Ian said pretty credible allegations that something very violent happened uh, to this woman. That's the first thing. The second thing, and this is so important, is that this really does give cover to people like Collins and Murkowski, who've been playing this game of saying, OK, I get it. He was put on the court to overturn Roe, but I don't think he's going to do it. And the sort of fatuous claims that they believe him when he says Roe is good precedent, this gives them cover. They don't have to guess what he's going to do in the future. All they need to do is scrutinize what is alleged to have happened in the past. That's a much easier proposition for them. And what Ian Milheiser tweeted, so to summarize, a confessed serial sexual predator nominated a man who is credibly accused of attempted rape to be the key vote to strip women of reproductive freedom. Which brings us back to the issue that both you and Ian wrote about, and that is this issue of Roe v. Wade. And what Brett Kavanaugh is saying right until now. I mean, we talked about as a story of um, Facebook and censorship and fact-checking and what is called fake news and what isn't. But the substance of the point that you wrote about on Roe v. Wade and what we understand Brett Kavanaugh has said right until now, in 2018. It's so important, Amy. It's the most important piece of this. This is a person who there was no doubt. Donald Trump was unequivocal when he ran for office. He said, I will put someone on the court who will overturn Roe. Donald Trump also talked about punishing women who had abortions. He was clear. Then he put someone on the court who has quite an extensive history of writing in praise, for instance, of Justice Rehnquist's dissent in Roe. It's not unclear. And that what, was Neil Gorsuch. Well, no, I, and now Kavanaugh. I mean, he's picked, explicitly picked someone who has spoken, who has written in the Garza case about abortion on demand. All the code words are there. Mm -hmm. And all the pro The Garza case, yes. the immigrant woman who wanted to have an abortion who was being held in Texas and ultimately did succeed in getting one, uh, but Kavanaugh actually wrote that she shouldn't. Right. He would have put up new imaginary roadblocks, having she kind of done everything she had to do under the law, and he constructed new tests that would have made it virtually impossible for her to procure an abortion. All of this happens. And the pro-life groups, by the way, pushing him out and celebrating him. This is the beginning of the end. Roe ends. And then he gets on the stand and says, I'm not going to do anything to Roe. And we've had to accept that. If you think about the visuals of those confirmation hearings of women dressed up as the handmaid's tale, you know, women being dragged, 200 women being dragged screaming from the Senate. And you can say, oh, this is not decorous and this is not polite, but this is life and death for women. And to say, oh, I have an open mind with the history that he has. That's the central issue that we're losing a little bit now in conversations about whether he told the truth or even this conversation. There's no doubt what will happen to women's reproductive health care. You can call it what you want to call it. You can call it reversing row. You can call it hollowing out row. We know where he stands. And the notion that this is going to be a hard question for Collins and Murkowski, who claim to be uh, for reproductive rights, this just got a lot easier for them. Now they just have to say, we should hear this woman out. And we will see what happens, whether uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford is able to testify before the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, to talk about what she alleges is Brett Kavanaugh's attempted rape of her. 
Dahlia Lithwick, I want to thank you for being with us, senior editor at Slate.com, and Ian Milheiser, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress Action Fund. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, we go south to Texas, to the story of a man who is in his apartment. A police officer enters his apartment, thinking it's her own, and shoots him dead. We'll talk about what happened next. Stay with us. Has got to windows, but the sunshine never comes through. You know it's always dark and dreary since I broke off, baby, with you. I live on a lonely avenue. My little girl wouldn't say I do, but I feel so sad and blue. And it's all because of you. Lonely Avenue by Ray Charles here on Democracy Now! As we go to Dallas, where protests continue in the wake of the shooting and killing of a 26-year-old black man in his own apartment by a white Dallas police officer. The officer, Amber Geiger, has been charged with manslaughter after she entered Botham Shemjan's apartment less than two weeks ago and opened fire, killing him. Police claim the officer believed that his apartment was hers. Outrage is growing as the community demands answers about the circumstances of Botham Jean's death. On Sunday, nearly 100 protesters marched through Dallas with two coffins to AT&T Stadium ahead of the Dallas Cowboys game. The coffins symbolize the deaths of Botham Jean and O'Shea Terry, who also was fatally shot this month by a North Texas police officer. Questions have been raised over why there was a three-day delay in charging Officer Geiger and how she failed to know she was not in her own apartment when she killed both him, Jean, in his. Jean's family is also criticizing the police for issuing and making public information from a search warrant on Jean's apartment. A police affidavit shows the officer seized, among other items, about 10 grams of marijuana and a marijuana grinder from Jean's apartment. This is Allison Jean, Botham's mother, speaking at a news conference Friday. The information received yesterday is, to me, worse than the call that I got on the morning of Friday, September 7th. To have my son smeared in such a way, I think shows that there are persons who are really nasty, who are really dirty, and are going to cover up for the devil, Amber Geiger. I don't know my son to be involved in such. And I want to find out whether the toxicology reports on, I, I, on Amber has been released because she was the murderer. Amber Geiger is out on $300,000 bond. Investigators have taken a blood sample from the officer to test for drugs and alcohol, but there's no information on results of that test or any information on a search warrant of her apartment. Well, for more, we're joined by civil rights attorney Lee Merritt, representing the family of both of them, um, Lee Merritt, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you explain what's happening in this case? I mean, people have to be all over as they hear the story of a police officer who gets off duty, walks into well, the police claim she thought it was her apartment, but it was the apartment of Botham Jean, and then shoots him dead. Please explain. Yeah, we know that if this were in the reverse, for example, if a black man walked into a white police officer's home and shot them to death and then claimed he thought he was in his apartment, this, this would be going very, very differently. Um, and so right now we know that what Amber Geiger has offered as her explanation isn't true. It's, it's demonstratively false. She, her story has changed significantly since September 6, when she offered that uh, she was uh, trying her key at the door. Both of them opened the door, um, she surprised him—I'm sorry, surprised her, and then she shot him. Um, the story that, that she offered to Rangers a few days later was that she actually entered the apartment that, the, where the door was already open, um, saw a silhouette thought it to be a burglar, gave it instructions, and then fired at it. Neither of those stories makes sense, because it just doesn't neither comport with common sense or the reality uh, of, of the layout of that apartment. Number one, outside of her apartment looks completely different uh, than, than 
than the apartment of Botham Jean. His apartment has, for example, a big right, black, bright red rug uh, there to greet people so that they will know that, that it's, it's his apartment. Her apartment didn't have that rug there. Uh, those doors are sure shut doors. And so uh, I, I've been in Mr. Um, Jean's apartment. I've, I've let the door go slowly and they slam shut uh, every time. And so uh, the idea that it was somehow mysteriously open um, it just doesn't comport with the mechanics of the apartment. Um, Botham Jean, a native of St. Lucia, graduated from Harding University in Arkansas, extremely popular and beloved there, worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers, a multinational audit and consulting firm in downtown Dallas. Uh, Lee Merritt, was um, Amber Geiger's apartment ra raided and searched by police? I mean, you have uh, Botham Jean's mother saying they are now leading a smear campaign the police against him. Yeah, as you pointed out, uh, both of them, lived 26 years. Um, he took steps to not only not be accused of a crime, but to completely avoid police encounters. His mom will describe to you uh, that he was definitely afraid of American police and the ideal of a police encounter. So he kept his registrations up to date. He kept his car mechanics up to date because he feared that some sort of traffic stop would lead him into an unwanted encounter with what what has a national or international reputation as a, a very deadly police force. And he went 26 years without being accused of any crime whatsoever, avoiding contact with law enforcement whatsoever. It took him being killed by a Dallas police officer for him to become a criminal. Um, and, and the Dallas Police Department sought a warrant to enter his home. Um, and, and to specifically look for evidence of a crime, to look for drug paraphernalia. That's what the warrant called for, uh, following his murder. Um, and there was, there was no raid of her home. There were no warrants issued for any of her property. There was no warrant issued for her car or for her locker at the, um, at the police department that she allegedly just left. There was no warrant issued for her apartment just below. And so the focus of this investigation, since it since it happened, has been on ways to find exculpatory evidence or looking for ways to justify her actions that are clearly unjustifiable. There, there could be no place uh, uh, that would, is supposed to offer more refuge than one's own home. So what is the family demanding right now? Also, uh, Officer Geiger didn't have to speak to police, is this right, for three—I mean, she was a police officer, but for three days? That's right. And, and, and in fairness, no one has to—no uh, one accused of a crime has to speak uh, to uh, police officers ever, of course, under the— um, uh, fifth Amendment—I'm uh, sorry, under the, the, uh, yeah, the Fifth Amendment, uh, you, you, citizens are protected from um, having to testify against themselves. Uh, however, law enforcement officers are giving three days under their internal affairs uh, policies to prepare a statement. Uh, she volunteered her story the, the night of. Unfortunately, it changed since then. Uh, to back up what this family is demanding in this case is that the, the, the charges that have gone forward three days later, which was manslaughter, be increased to murder. Uh, we can't find a sufficient justification for her entering his home. And we know now that what she's saying isn't true. And so that, that applies that element of malice that we think that, uh, that the charge of murder as opposed to manslaughter would be more appropriate. A simple request that this family has made of the city of Dallas and the Dallas Police Department is that this officer be fired. Whether she committed murder or manslaughter, as we believe, she committed a crime, a serious crime. There's no reason that she should remain employed with the Dallas Police Department. Mm. We've also called for the Dallas Police Department to end the smear campaign against the deceit and against Botham Jean and focus their energies on gathering evidence, collecting uh, or discovering witnesses who might uh, make clear what actually happened that night. Well, I want to thank you for being with us, and I hope that we can speak to you soon about developments in this case. Lee Merritt, civil rights attorney representing the family of Botham Jean, who was shot and killed by Dallas police officer Amber Geiger in his own apartment. She said she mistook his apartment for hers. Happy birthday to Sam Alcoff. That does it for our broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.